All right. So you heard a lot about imaging yesterday from, from David and how the imaging process works. So here I'm just gonna review some of those steps and trying to give you a sort of a pictorial view of what really happens and then uh, really go into how we do this in CASA. So I'm, we're gonna do imaging live as I speak, uh, just, to, just to show you how, how things work. All right, so, so just, to, just as a reminder, imaging is kind of made of, I like, I like to think of imaging as made of two parts. The first part where you do your gridding of the, the, of the visibility function, uh, the weighting and the inverse Fourier transform to create the dirty image. So that's the first step is basically inverting, uh, grading, weighting and inverting. And the second step is from your dirty image, which looks terrible, uh, you want to use the clean, uh, clean algorithm to uh, carry out the convolution and produce a cleaned image, which you then want to use uh, for your science. The goal uh, is to obtain an image from calibrated visibilities that is as clear of artifacts as possible as a, and as accurate as a representation as possible of the true sky image. Now, this process is not perfect. And the disclaimer, as David mentioned extensively yesterday, things to keep you awake at night, is that actually there's an infinite number of images that can produce uh, your sample visibility function because your visibility function, you don't know the visibility function everywhere in your space, but only at some sampled locations. So there's not a one-to-one -one relation between the calibrated images and uh, visibilities and the final clean image. Okay, so here's kind of a pictorial view of what happens in imaging. Um, this is all things that David talked about yesterday, but I just want to go through it again so you follow me when I, when I go and do this in CASA. Uh, so you've got your, uh, sa your uh, sampled visibility function, real and imaginary part, as I showed you just now in the Jupyter notebook. Uh, you, what, what you're going to have to do because of the fast Fourier transform is you're going to want to grid this uh, and you want to weight this in whichever way you want and you inverse Fourier transform it to obtain your dirty image. At the same time, uh, you do the same for the UV coverage and you inverse Fourier transform it to get the dirty beam. And as a reminder, the dirty image is the true image convolved by the dirty beam, gives you the dirty image. And the true visibility function multiplied by the sampling function gives you the sampled visibility function. So, what do we do in cleaning? So this is the first part that I was mentioning, reading, waiting, and just doing an inverse Fourier transform. Um, and the next step is the, is the clean the convolution. So you, end, you, you have something like this, which is an image with some side lobes that are, that are very dirty and don't look very, very nice. Um, and the first step is to, uh, we, we're gonna draw masks around regions where we think the signal, the true signal is really coming from. Typically, these are the brightest regions in the image. And uh, what clean is gonna do, it's gonna add, it's gonna add a point source uh, at a location corresponding to the brightest point in, within these masks. So say I draw a mask around this source, it's gonna pick the brightest point and it's gonna add uh, uh, its brightness multiplied by a loop gain gamma, which is typically 10%. So it's gonna add 10% of its brightness uh, at this, in this image here, which is our model. And the model is always a point source, so it's just a single pixel, basically. Okay, so then what it's gonna do is it's gonna convolve this model by the dirty beam. So this doesn't look very dirty, but there are side lobes here that, that you can't see on the, on the screen. Um, and to obtain, so you convolve, the, you convolve this by the dirty beam and you obtain uh, basically a, a dirty model, and you subtract the dirty model from the dirty image to obtain some residuals. Now this, again, this looks the same as that, but actually there's a lot less flux here where the peak of, where the maximum peak was. And uh, at this point, when you, lo you look at the residual images, at the residual image, and you ask yourself, is, does it look like noise? If the answer is no, which it is the case in, in this case, because there's clearly still some emission that is likely real, what you're going to do is you're going to repeat. So you, you go back here, and you, instead of taking the original dirty image, you take your residual image, and you do the same. You add another point source, you convolve it, uh, and then subtract it. 
and then you look at the residual image again and you keep doing it, you're gonna basically remove Fruxum from the image until your residual just looks like noise. When it looks like noise, uh, you, you're basically done with the deconvolution. And what you do is you take your final model, which is made of a lot of these tiny white dots being our point sources. This is our final model after 7,800 iterations. So there can be a lot of iterations depending on how much flux you have. And you are gonna convol we're gonna convolve this model by the clean beam. So the clean beam is a 2D Gaussian fitted to the center of the dirty beam. Now they look the same here because of the color didn't come up, but this is basically a perfect 2D Gaussian, the clean beam. And it's gonna be added to the, to the final residual image, which should look like noise. Again, this just looks like zero, but there's actually, there actually is noise there. Um, and this will allow you to obtain the final clean image, which is a huge amount better than the dirty image you started with. All right, so that's gonna be the process. But before that, uh, we're gonna have to go from mere calibrated visibility all the way to a clean image. And there are some steps in between uh, the uh, final calibrated set and uh, the imaging. So within mere, we're gonna have to output, because we're gonna do the imaging in CASA, we're gonna output the calibrated visibilities using this routine called autofits, which kind of does it automatically. And we run this on the target visibility data because that's the one we want to image. We don't wanna image the calibrators, although we may want to for quality assurance purposes. Um, and this will allow you to write UV fits files, which are uh, files that, are, that should be in theory compatible between different software packages. And what this will do, it will create one UV fits file per chunk, per sideband, per receiver. This, this process takes, a, takes some time depending on how many channels you have in your data. So it's just a warning here if you're gonna use this as a reference in the future. Um, and then what we're gonna do, we have all these UV fits files uh, produced by Mir. We go into CASA and we import them into CASA using this custom uh, Python script that, uh, that I wrote that basically, I mean, you don't need to know what goes on there, but it's basically taking into account uh, what was in the UV fits file and translating it into something that, that CASA can understand. And, uh, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna run this script on all of the UV fits files and then concatenate all the data in CASA together to obtain a single uh, measurement set. So measurement sets are the fundamental uh, CASA files which contain uh, your visibilities. And again, they're just big tables of values of UV, real imaginary weights and some other ancillary data that, that you may need for calibration. But we're gonna just do imaging, so that's all we care about. And then we're gonna inspect the data with, uh, with, with a couple of tasks, namely list, list OBS and uh, POTMS. And we're gonna do a little bit of the error recognition if you like, that Cardo talked about, talked about yesterday. And okay, and we're gonna flood some bad channels if, need, if needed. It's typically needed, and you, you'll see why in a second. And then you're gonna have to decide whether you wanna image uh, a, a specific spectral line or you wanna image uh, the continuum emission, so the emission coming from all of the frequency band uh, that, that the SMA covered. So if you want to image the continuum, uh, you want to first flag this, the channels where you have uh, lines, which may contaminate your continuum. So you first flag those. Um, you want to flag enough to cover the entire line, but not too many, because otherwise you're flagging uh, most of your continuum out. Um, and then you, you want to average the channels together within each chunk, for example, using some of these, uh, uh, some of these tools. Uh, which will mainly reduce the number of visibilities and speed up the imaging. Now, there is a caveat to that, that so you may do uh, frequency averaging, so averaging visibilities along the frequency axis, or you may average visibilities along the time axis as well, because remember the, the SMA, for example, uh, takes data every 30 to 60 seconds, so you have one data point at, at, at that kind of interval, which, which you, and, and thus you may end up with millions of visibilities. And so if you reduce them, you will speed up the imaging. However, you need to be careful because, oh no, because, um, so this is a UV coverage. And remember, that didn't work, but basically uh, you, have, you have tracks uh, in UV space and, and these tracks, for example, like, like these, those didn't come up, or for example, like these, 
uh, represent different uh, visibilities at different times, and tracks that are kind of parallel to one another radially represent different frequencies. And so what happens when you average is you basically average uh, lo different locations uh, in UV space, and this can lead to bandwidth and, and time smearing, and if you do too much of it, um, this may be a problem uh, for your imaging. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it's covered in the, in the interferometry book. Um, but for SMA data in compound configurations, typically you can average together all the channels in every single chunk. Okay, if you want to instead image the line, the first thing you want to do is subtract the continuum emission uh, using channels away from the line because you don't want your continuum to contaminate uh, your line. And you can do this in visibility space uh, using the UV concept CASA task. And all it does is basically the same as baselining for a single dish observations. It basically uh, fits a function to your, to your continuum and subtracts, it, and subtracts it off to leave you just with the line emission. And then again, average in time and need, if needed uh, to, speed up, to speed up the imaging. Okay, and finally, uh, the imaging part, which is, again, all this process that I described earlier, all of this is, is carried out in a single CASA task called T-Clean, which is, uh, I like to say, it's a bit of a monster task because, because it does all these steps, there's a lot of inputs that you need to, that you want to understand and that you need to provide to T-Clean in order to, to carry out this process. So beyond file names, one has to define things like the image size and the pixel size in arc seconds, uh, if you're imaging a line, you're going to end up with an, with an image cube. And so you want to define what channel size and how many channels you want, uh, what the rest frequency of your line is. Um, then you're going to have to define how you want to weight your visibilities. Uh, do you want natural weighting, uniform weighting, uh, Briggs weighting? And then you want to choose your clean the convolution algorithm. We're not going to do too much of that. We're going to use simple hog bomb clean. Uh, for now, but there are more sophisticated uh, cleaning algorithms. And then you want to define how many clean iterations you want to do or how or tell CASA basically when you want to stop this iterative process. We're actually not going to do that either because we're going to use interactive mode where you can basically check the residual image every time and uh, and stop it if you want. So. And here I have some hints, some tips on how to manage this this uh, this, uh, this this monstrous uh, task uh, by uh, using some of the, some of these tips uh, within Casa that I'm going to show you now. Um, uh, so Casa, I'm going to pull it up now. So Casa is a software package that is built. that is built with Python. So you can basically uh, carry out any of your Python, let me change folder. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna run CASA. I'm gonna start CASA. Here you go, it's starting up in my terminal. And it runs IPython. So you can, you can, you can run any of your py favorite Python uh, commands like a equals to three, to three, print three. Yeah, uh, all of your usual Python things. So that's handy. Um, and, and so what we're going to do, I, I created, so I created a script uh, that you may want to follow, may or may, you may want to tweak, <coughs> you may want to follow uh, when going from, um, from mere calibrated data sets uh, into CASA. So I'm going to go through what I just described, what I just described uh, directly here live. So, so the first thing we're going to do, I, zoom, I think I zoomed in enough. Um, so here, what we're doing is we're using this Mirfits to Casa uh, script that I wrote to basically import uh, the visibilities from UV fits files uh, that we have in this folder somewhere. Um, HD yeah, so in this folder, we have all of these UV fits files that I created with the auto fits mirror routine. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, and I'm gonna go through this loop, which for, for, for my source, which is called HD127821 for this real SMA observation, for every single one of the two receivers, 
for every single one of the two sidebands per receiver and for every single one of the chunks for each sideband goes through and, and runs this and runs this script that that goes from a UV fits file to an M to a Casa MS. And so I'm gonna so I'm gonna run it. I'm not actually gonna run it now because it takes a little bit of time. Uh, only two minutes, but I just didn't wanna slow everything down. And uh, okay. And so the next step is, I mean, you can check that the MSs were created. I didn't do it here, but I've already done this before. So, so you can see here that all the, for every one of the UVFITS files, you, you, you've created an MS file. <clears throat> and, uh, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna concatenate using the concat command. We're gonna concatenate all of the visibilities um, uh, from all of these MS all, from all of these MS files into a single MS file, and again, I'm not going to run that, uh, but um, we, because again, it takes like something like two minutes. Uh, then I'm going to do I'm going to use the list obs command to so the list obs command is really the first call for help within Casa. So here you go. Oh, I, what I didn't mention is that when you start up Casa, you get this log this log window. And this log, every time you run a command, it, it gives you basically a description of what is actually going on. And it's very useful for you to understand uh, what is going on. So, all right. So in this, in this list obs command, it basically gives you a full description of what, what kind of visibility there is in there. So in this case, it tells us the observer was me, uh, the, the, the data is from the SMA. And here, the first thing that it tells you is temporal information. So it tells you that this data was taken on 14th December and between these, these time ranges, these various time ranges, and this is the source that was observed at the time, so where we were pointing. This is how many visibilities there are in there and, uh, and, other, informa and other information such as what's the length of the, what, how, how long were we integrating for every integration and what spectral, what chunks and what spectral windows were used. Uh, for for that given time interval, and the second uh, the second um, header information that you have here is the fields that were observed. In my case, because we exported from Mir only the target data, uh, you only see my my target here. But if you had exported the calibrators as well, you would see HC one seventy two one three C eighty four blah 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 all the calibrators that that you had, and this is basically the array and declination of of my source in the sky. And uh, what else is interesting here? This is the spectral setup. So here it tells you what, what, your, what spectral setup your data was taken in. You have eight spectral windows, which correspond to the eight chunks uh, of, the, of, the, of the SMA, four for each sideband, and the number of channels that are in each of those chunks. So there are, there, in this case, I kept 2,048 channels for each of the chunks. And here it tells you the uh, central frequency, tells you the frequency at the center of this chunk. So in this case, you see it was 230.544 gigahertz, 228.5 gigahertz. They're spaced by two gigahertz because that's just the way they're spaced in the S for the SMA. And this is the width of a single channel in kilohertz. So it's uh, in this case, 1.1 megahertz. And uh, yeah, so basically this is kind of to orient or to, uh, to orient yourself uh, within within your your data set, uh, then this is there's some some sources, but you don't really care about that. And here there's there's some uh, information about the antennas, uh, the antenna IDs, uh, where they were in longitude and latitude, what diameter they had, and all that. So this is kind of how you find out what's in an MS file. You use this list ops command. Cool. Now, so then the first thing you want to do, as I said, you want to inspect the data and flag what you need to flag. Now, typically, when you do your calibration in MIR, you're going to, uh, you're going to not, you're going to, okay, so let me rephrase this. So for the SMA, uh, for every chunk, you typically want to remove the channels in frequency that are at the edge. And typically, you remove about 8% uh, of the total number of channels at, at each edge. So basically, what we're doing here in CASA is we are going to flag those because we're not going to use them further in our analysis. Um, and, and you can see if you 
if you plot the visibilities, you can actually see that these channels are, are more noisy and worse than the other channels. But because we know we're going to have to flag these anyway, because they're intrinsically bad, we know they're intrinsically bad, we're just going to go straight away and flag, <coughs> straight, straight on and flag them. So we're going to flag about 130 channels out of a total of 2048. You, are, you may ask me, how do you know how many <coughs> channels there are in a chunk from list stubs? Um, we're going to flag 130 at each edge, and, and, we're, and then we're going to execute the flagging using this uh, flag data command. Let's see if I can see if I can just run these. <coughs> yeah. So we're going to run the flag data command. This is going to go on and do some flagging. If you look at the log, it tells you a bit more. It tells you for each chunk how, what percentage of the data was flagged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then we're going to inspect our visibilities. So first, we're going to plot uh, what the amplitude. So we're going to do what Cardo basically said yesterday. We're going to inspect and see what it looks like and see if we have some bad data. So first, we're going to plot uh, amplitude versus channel. This is what what's happening here using this plot MS task. So in Casa, the way you look at your visibilities is using this uh, plot MS uh, task. Uh, now, this plot MS task typically requires quite a bit of memory, so it can be slow. I did, I did test this and it did run in a reasonable amount of time. Here we go. Um, because you're loading something like a million points or, or even more, so, so it can take time. And so what we're gonna plot here, as I said, is amplitude as a function of channel for every, for every chunk uh, of our SMA data. All right, almost there. <clears throat> And I also found that having zoom on slows this down. Uh, so okay, so here is what our amplitudes look at, look like as a function of as a function of channel. Uh, you notice the data looks mostly good. You've got this um, this enhanced uh, this region of enhanced amplitudes, and I'm going to ask you if you can guess what this may be. Come on, any takers? Line. <laughs> What kind of line? Atmospheric line. Yes, that's an atmospheric lines line. So what happens is when you where you have atmospheric line lines, which you can check in the Passpan visualizer, uh, which is on the SMA website, uh, you're going to have an increased uh, amount of uh, an increased amount of noise in this region, which is which leads to this to this peak here. So. So this data set, in this data set, we're mostly interested in continuum. So if this is narrow enough, you can, and, and, it's, and the spike is not too big, you can sort of ignore it. Now it depends who you ask for this kind of stuff, or you can flag it. If you wanted to flag it, let's, let's do it. You're gonna press this button, uh, which allows you to mark a region. <coughs> for example, something like, let's do something like this. Yeah. And we're gonna press the, the little flag which is going to flag it. And hopefully not a long period of time. Oh, you got a spin wheel up there. There you go. Okay, so now that data is thrown away. All right, Ricardo. Okay, one point. Notice there that you flag basically everything that belongs in that channel. You don't just clip off the things off the top. Because if you what were you to mean? just, well, if you were to just take off the noisy points off yes. the top, right? you will end up screwing up the noise statistics inside that bin and you'll get something that looks super funky weird and you've basically kind of sort of corrupted. Yeah, so there's more atmospheric lines coming up. So that was just chunk zero. This chunk one, there's more sort of badness probably here, but it's probably okay. This is where interesting continuum. Uh, okay, so this channel looks good. Uh, this chunk looks like it probably has some badness here at the edge. You could, you could flag a little bit more of the edge if you were worried about that, but most of it seems rather fine. Notice that the, the noise, so the width of this, of the amplitudes increases on this side compared to that side. It's because the, 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 the bandpass of this may is noisier on this side compared to the, compared to the other. It's just an intrinsic uh, receiver property. And here, maybe there are a couple of bad points there. Again, they're, 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 they're only two out of a huge amount of points, so they're not going to affect our continuum, because in our continuum, we're basically going to take the average of all of these points. So only two points that are only a factor of a few away are not going to make a difference. 
And here it is more. So, so basically what Carter was saying is when you draw your region, like you may be tempted to do this. That's bad. You don't want to do that. You need to flag everything. All right, so I'm not going to flag it in this case, but uh, this is just to give you an idea of the kind of error recognition that you may want to do. This is perfectly good, and this might have some badness at the edge. Okay, so we've, expect, we've inspected the data in AMP to choose a function channel. The other thing we can do is we can look at the, so we might want to do some preliminary UV analysis, which is what we did in the previous, in the previous tutorial. So what we're going to show here is we're going to look at the real part of the visibility function as a function of UV distance and see if that looks like a, like a Bessel function and therefore we might have a ring or I don't know if it looks flat. Again, you can do this in PlotMS. I, I did it in a scripted way, but you can also do it here using this GUI. Uh, it's very simple and self-explanatory. Uh, so it's going to load the data again. <clears throat> you leave that atmospheric line in there on purpose, or would you have just taken that out in mirror to begin with? So in mirror, ah, here we go. So in mirror, there is a problem that you can't flag specific channels. That's why I do it afterwards in Casa. So in mirror, you, yeah, you kind of flag just certain channels within the, within the band pass. It's just a, an issue with mirror, or it's just intrinsic to mirror. Okay, so here's the real part of the visibility function versus UV distance, and this is what it looks like. And it just looks like mostly noise. All right, so you may not be able to, to deduce uh, very much from this. You, well, you might, if you have a keen eye, you might see that this, that the shortest baseline seems to be, there seems to be like a, an increasing trend uh, in, the, in the real going to shorter UV distances. So I'm going to ask you, what does it mean if instead of having a flat, uh, flat noise, you have, an, you have a decreasing function, function of UV distance in the real part of the visibilities? Any takers? All right, well, it just means that your source is likely to be resolved. Now, this is hard to tell because the data is very noisy, but if you look very carefully, you see that this is increasing. So there may be some resolved structure uh, in the data. Okay, so there's, there's nothing that looks particularly bad here. It's just, it's just noise, so we don't want to flag anything. Uh, okay, so we're going to go ahead with the continue. Um, so there were no true lines uh, in the in, in 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 the data that we wanted to flag out, so lines that originate from your from your actual source that you're observing, uh, so we don't need to do any of that flagging uh, because there is no line emission from this source. Um, so and what, so what we're going to do here is we're going to we are going to ah okay so here I'm actually checking if there isn't any line emission. And the way you do that is instead of plotting amplitude as a function of channel, you want to plot the amplitude as a function of frequency. So you can tell if the CO line is there or not in the visibilities. Uh, but I'm not going to do it here because I know already that there, is no, that there is no line. But this is something you would do if you didn't know. OK, and then what I'm going to do, finally, before imaging, the last step is I'm going to average in frequency. So I'm going to take all of those channels that you saw in the plot of amplitude versus channel and average them together because I'm interested in the continuum anyway. So I can just average them all together and then the imaging will go faster. Um, so, so what this means is basically average 2048 channels in the first chunk together, average 2048 in the second channel, in the second chunk altogether, and so, so on and so forth for all of the eight chunks. And so we're just going to run this. And then we're going to run this split command, which takes your uh, old MS file and creates a new MS file uh, with, the, with the data averaged with the data averaged together along the frequency axis. And so this is very quick. So let's try to do it. Oh, here we go. I didn't find something. 
<coughs> okay. So, I mean, in Python, you can copy paste directly, or you can run one at a time, or you can type directly into the into the IPython there. And uh, again, if you look at the log, you may wonder, oh, what's going on now? It's not responding. You look at the log and you're like, oh, it's doing something. Here you go, it just finished. And so the, the log is just telling you what's happening. Um, okay, and, and so now we're gonna run list stubs to check that everything went fine. There you go. And indeed, as you, and indeed, as you expect, uh, now the number of channels in each chunk is, is simply one instead of 2048. So we've averaged everything together. So, so that worked. All right. So at this point, um, what you would do is if you have more than one track on your source, uh, that you calibrate it all separately and you import it into CASA all separately, you would concatenate them all together if you want to make a combined image of all of your, of all of your tracks together. Now, I'm not going to do that here, but I do have multiple tracks for this target. So I'm going to directly uh, read, I've created that MS file uh, of all the tracks together and I'm just going to, I'm just going to use this for the imaging. Okay. Oh, and what I didn't say is uh, with PlotMS, you can also plot like your UV coverage. You can plot basically anything you want. Okay, so the first thing, okay, we're gonna go through some of the inputs. So what are we gonna, what are we gonna input? We're gonna input uh, an image name. So this is the name of our output images that our output images are gonna have. And uh, this is the name of our input visibility data, which is just this uh, variable that I, that is just an address where the MS file is. So this is the input visibility data and this is the output, the name of the output image that we're gonna create. And now we're going on to the imaging parameters. So interactive Z equals to true basically just tells, just basically every time uh, one, residual one residual image is, is produced, um, uh, it basically uh, shows us what the, that residual image look, looks like and we can uh, modify the mask if we want, and we can decide how many more cycles of the convolution to go through and uh, to update that residual image. So the number of iteration, here I put a very large number because anyway, we're using interacting modes and this, this is not gonna matter. But I found that if you leave it as one, CASA behaves a little strange. So I just leave it as a very large number, but actually we're not gonna do that many iterations uh, in the end. Um, then we're gonna choose uh, a cell size. So the cell is basically the pixel size of your image and an image size, which is the number of pixels that you have in your image. So how do you choose the pixel size? Uh, David explained yesterday how you do this formally. Typically, you want this to be uh, a small fraction, less than a third of what you expect your dirty, your, your clean beam to look like. So the inner core of the dirty beam. Uh, to, uh, to look like. So it's about a third of the full width half max of that, uh, of that core of the dirty beam. And uh, generally you know this in advance because you've asked for a specific configuration for, from the SMA to achieve a certain resolution, uh, or you can calculate it as David explained yesterday from the, from the maximum UV distance that you have in your data. And then the image size, typically you want about the size or twice the size uh, of the primary beam. And this is in number of pixels. So 512 pixels, so about 0.1 arc seconds makes an image that is 51 arc second in width. Uh, 51 arc second width. And uh, what does this say? Oh, uh, this is better if it's a power of two because it makes the fast Fourier transform more efficient. So if you can make this a power of two uh, is better. Um, and then the weighting function which we just choose to be the natural weighting function. You can choose it to be uniform if you want higher resolution, but lower sensitivity. But for now, we're gonna go for maximum sensitivity and worst resolution. And if you choose, if you choose a weighting function that is the Briggs weighting function, you're gonna to have to define this robust parameter. Uh, again, this is something that David covered yesterday, so I'm not gonna go back into the details. And again, if you, and then if you want a UV taper, again, something that David covered, uh, you can include it here uh, in, in arc seconds. And so, by the way, uh, all, of these, all of this information about what different 
uh, inputs mean, you can get it from, from CASA itself by doing help declean. Okay, let's blow it up. So help declean tells you like, oh, this is the um, huge amount of parameters that you can have in a declean call. And so if you go down, you can find an explanation for all of the input parameters. What I find very useful, and maybe not everyone knows, is you can search, if you only care about your weighting parameter, what it could it be, you can do a search here by doing sl forward slash uh, weighting, then enter, and it will go to the next, yep, to the next instance that weighting is, is being set there. And then if you do command N, I believe, nope, command G, or control N, no, control G, no. I don't remember which one it is, but you can you can basically make it go to the next one. No, I don't know, it doesn't work. I never use, I never do this on my Mac actually. I typically do it on my Linux machines in work, but anyway, so there's a way to, to go to the next one. Okay, so that's just a brief interval there. And then, here in the spec mode parameter, we're going to tell it that we want multi-frequency synthesis, which is just the selection you want for if you want if you're doing continuous imaging. And then, so all of these parameters are the gridding and clean uh, algorithm choices. So we're just going to use a standard gridding, which is the gridding that David uh, explained yesterday, uh, using the Hogbaum uh, algorithm for deconvolution which is just a simple one where you basically create a model that is a, what is a sum of point sources. And then some parameters. So these are actually all standard parameters. I haven't changed any of them. So if you don't input them, they will, be, they will default to these. And uh, so there's a lot of detail that goes in there. This is basically how Clean decides, uh, how Clean may decide to stop every time. But since we're doing this interactively, this is not really very applicable to, to the way we're where we're doing the cleaning. So this is if you wanted to automatize the cleaning uh, itself. Okay, so let's just select all of these. All of these parameters, we're gonna put them into CASA, just with copy paste. And we're gonna remove the images if they already exist, which they might, because I might have run this before. And then we're gonna run tclean where you have all of these parameters inserted here. As I said, it's a bit of a monster script. Okay, so you run it, and really you wanna be looking at the log at this point. Um, so, yes, come on. Come on, zoom. Zoom is not cooperating. Oh, I know why it's not cooperating because there's a, there's, there's, yeah, there's a bar that is completing here, so it's probably updating every time. So basically the first step that is happening is it, it graded the visibilities. It, it, you really have no uh, control over, over what is happening here, except what you inputted at the beginning. Uh, so it's grading the visibilities, it's weighting them, and it's uh, doing the first uh, inverse Fourier transform to create the dirty, to create the dirty image. So, so you can see here, come on zoom. So this is, these are just all the inputs that we put in. It's just print them, off, print them again. And, okay, come on. Okay, before we go into this, I'm gonna go back, show you what happened in the log. So Luca, you already averaged everything into a single channel. Did you already... uh, per chunk. Oh, per chunk. Okay. Yeah. So you do have multi frequency because you have yeah yeah eight yeah chunks? yeah yeah eight chunks yeah yeah I don't know it's not loading here I don't know what to do <coughs> okay basically it's saying here make PSF so it's creating so it's for transform oh here we go. So we're transforming and creating the dirty beam. Um, and it's telling us that the theoretical sensitivity that you expect from the image 
is this much in just super beam and that's just calculated from the from the sigmas or the weights in the visibilities uh, and then it's telling you that the, that the core of the of the dirty beam would be about 4.3 by 3.6 arc seconds for this observation um, and at a, at a position angle because it's a 2d gaussian so it has a position angle of 50 degrees and okay and then it gives us some information about the image maybe maybe thinks so. it doesn't like scrolling Okay, anyway, it does it gives us some information about the image, like what is the maximum in the image in, in, in the Skipper beam, what is the minimum, and what is the total model flux at the moment, uh, which is zero, because we haven't, we haven't gone any, through any deconvolution yet. And, uh, and then what it presents us with is the, where did that go? Hmm. Somewhere went my residual image. I think I reduced it, but it just, just went away. All right, we're going to kill it. Sorry about that. All right, we're going to restart Casa. <laughs> All right, I think we're back. And then we rerun T-Clean. Cool. Okay, so it's rerunning. And it should present us with the, with the residual image. So if we go back to, to what I said in the, in the keynote, uh, so we've done So we've done this step, and it's going to show us now what the dirty image is. And once we have the dirty image, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to see what our morphology may look of our emission may look like. And we're going to decide how to draw some masks around where we believe true emission uh, to, 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 to be located. <laughs> Do you have any questions while we wait? Feel free. Yeah. Does this work? Uh, work consistently or smoother on your Linux? Is the problem with yeah, well, I mean, the problem here was, yeah, so there's an issue with the Mac when you, when you send, when you reduce something, then, then it doesn't find it anymore. Uh, but uh, it works faster definitely than this. I mean, it worked faster on my laptop, even if I'm not running Zoom. It, it requires some memory, so it, it works faster on Linux for sure. Especially for this data is relatively straightforward. It's not very heavy, so yeah. Okay, so so here's the, our, our dirty image. And what we found in this specific data set is we have some source here, um, which maybe may or may not be unresolved. 
and, and some kind of elongated uh, source uh, right at the face center. And, and so the, the objective of this, of, this, of this program was to image uh, a, a belt uh, around this nearby star that is located here at the center of the image. And indeed, what we see here is an elongated emission that is resembling a belt that is observed not face on like a ring, as we said earlier, but more like edge on. So that's what, that's what that is. And this is some emission that we didn't expect from probably a background galaxy. So, okay, so how do we clean here? We draw some masks, so clean as some drawing tools, like a circle here, or like a, a regular shape there. And we're gonna, we're gonna try and use both. So we draw a circle around here. Let's see, something like that. Covering your emission and, and you double click to create your mask. And then you wanna draw a region around this because we believe there's some emission there as well. But you don't wanna to be too specific with this otherwise, or you don't wanna draw a region around, around just something that might look, might be noise like something out here because that would be, because that would be bad. Because then if you clean something that looks like noise, it's gonna uh, basically make it stand out even more, which is not what you want. Now, what I find in clean is that the color of the region is green and it's very hard to see on the color scale. So the first thing I do typically is I change the color map to another, to another color map so that I can see better what, what I'm drawing. And we can draw like an irregular region around here. It doesn't matter too much what the region is because remember, uh, as long as it's reasonable, as, because remember, clean is always gonna go find the maximum brightness uh, within that region. Okay, so we've got our masks and the next step is we are gonna tell we're going to tell clean how many rounds of deconvolution to do, which, which is the process of finding the maximum, uh, create, putting that in the model, convolving it with the dirty beam, and subtracting that from this residual image to create a new residual image. And let's say we're going to do 10, we're going to do 10 cycles of that. So you just put 10 over there, and that's all you have to do. And then you say uh, up here, you just say continue. Okay, so now it's working. It's doing it's the convolution. Again, you can go to the log if the log comes up. Oh, here you go. So here it ran, it ran some minor cycle iterations. It tells you it ran from uh, iteration zero to 10. So it ran 10 new iterations. The model flux went from zero. We added about 1.1 millijoule to the model. And the peak of the residual image decreased from 1.5 millijanski to 0 0.7 millijanski. So we're removing flux from the image and adding it to the model. And what it's gonna do now, it's gonna bring us the new residual image. And what you will have seen is that it removed flux mainly from, from this source, which was the brightest. So it would have been the first one that Clean uh, would have chosen. And so basically this is just an iterative process. You just do it again and again until basically you have removed most of the most of the emission from what you believe to be your sources and the image looks consistent with noise so the, you can use some more formal thresholds so you can say you want to remove uh, the emission from your source uh, down to a maximum which is five times uh, this the one sigma rms noise level in the image or you can kind of do it by eye and you can see sort of all of the noise around and when the kind of the colors i'm doing it very empirically here when the colors look kind of similar to the noise around, you might decide to stop. So here might be already a good time to stop, but let's go a little bit, a little bit deeper. Uh, it doesn't matter too much if you go too deep because clean should converge, uh, at, least, at least theoretically, but we're gonna do another round and then, we're, and then that, that should be good enough. <laughs> so yeah, so, so clean is working and it's gonna bring us back the new residual image. And if you look at the log now again, it's gonna tell you again, it did. So it did the first 10, and then it did another 10, and the model's flux increased, and the peak decreased, and then it did another 10. And then here, here we're left with something like this, which looks like if you just saw this to begin with in the dirty image, you might have judged that this image is just noise and there's nothing there. So that just looks like noise, and so, We'll leave, it, we'll leave it at that. And so we stop it. We just press the big X at the top. All right, so our deconvolution is done. And what Clean 
And what Clean has done in this last second, Zoom cooperates. In this last second, what Clean did, it took our final model, convolved it with the Clean Beam, added the residual image that we saw at the very end, and produced a clean image that we're now going to look at with, uh, within CASA using the, using the viewer command. All right, so continue. All right, so it created, as you can see, Clean created several files. Uh, it created one file containing your final image, the dot image file. It, it created a dot mask file, which contains uh, your masks. So I'm going to show you all of these. So let's look at the mask. So these are, these are the masks that I drew. Um, note that uh, in interactive cleaning, you can change your masks as you go from iteration to iteration and you see some different region of your source popping out. You, you can change the shape, you can remove them and change the shape of these masks. But, but, but what's gonna be stored here is only the mask as it was in your very, very final step. And then you can look at what your model was and your model is just going to look like, oh, you, you can't see it. The rest of it. Oh, you can. Point source, <laughs> point source, point source. So that's your model. You can see it's not a very good model, but the, but the image is noisy enough that this may be what, uh, what the model really is. I mean, I have some a priori information that there is a belt at that location, so I can interpret that as an edge on belt. But if you didn't have that prior information, that could be just two galaxies and another galaxy here. Okay, so that's my model. So dot PB uh, is the primary beam. So it tells you uh, the response of a single antenna. So the, the, the response is 100% or one. So if I move the cursor to the center, so this, at the center you have something like one for the primary beam, uh, and then it goes down to 50% uh, towards, towards the edge of the image. Then you have your dot PSF file which is the dirty beam. This is your beautifully dirty beam. And, and you have your residual image, which is the last image that we saw in our interactive clean, which got added at the end. And this sum weight, which I never really understood what the point of it was, but, uh, um, but it's something to do with, the, with the, how the weights uh, become the uh, image, image noise but I never really use it. So I think you can safely ignore it. And then finally our image. Okay, let me remove some of these things. Okay. Mm. All right, so this is our image. So you can see now that the, um, now this is a not very high signal to noise detections that you have here uh, and here. Uh, but you can see that uh, the signal to noise became much higher compared to the to the to the dirty image. So the background is now darker because it's it's uh, it's lower. Because as Mark said, well, well, uh, because well, not as Mark said, that was self calibration. But basically, what we did is we took emission that used to be in the dirty beam lobes, and we put it right where it where where it belonged to. So so you you have a much cleaner image. Now, this is also this is still very noisy, but that's just the noise of the observations. So, okay, so I'm out of time. So I also, so because I don't have time to go through it, but I do have in this script, which again, I will make available to you. I also have um, uh, a description of line, line imaging that you can go through to image lines. And um, now I don't have time to go through it now, but uh, we'll go through it tomorrow uh, in your um, in your real data set uh, analysis, if you have a line. Uh, so uh, yeah, so with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and let me. Yeah. Um, that northern point source, is that real? After looking at the data, like on your own time, um, it's uh, so uh, the way you would the way you would judge that. So the first thing is you would do something like Cardo said yesterday. So you would basically measure the RMS of this image, so the noise level, and you can do that by just drawing like a, I mean the simplest, the most basic way is you just draw 
just through our region in CASA, something like this, where you know, where you think it's most likely just noise. I don't know, I draw something like that. And then you can look at the statistics and here it tells you what the RMS of that region is, which is uh, uh, 2.8, uh, what unit is this? Probably millijansky, right? Jansky. No, that, that's, uh, yeah, I think the problem is that I have other images open. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's better. Uh, so 0.4, yeah, 0.4 millijansky. Uh, so that's the RMS of, of, of the noise level. So, so the noise level is 0.4 millijansky. Okay, so now we remove this. And we look at the peak here. The peak here is 0 0.67, 0 0.7, let's say, 0.7 millijansky. So that peak is not really significant. So you wouldn't, you just wouldn't consider it like significant because it's only, what is it, two sigma or something, less than two sigma. Yeah. So what would be significant, like three or four sigma? Hmm? What would be significant? If it's I mean, this is, this, is, this opens a whole <laughs> can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna <laughs> go into now. It's it's really up to you. I think you can report whatever you want in your paper, but as long as you say it's three sigma or four sigma, then it's up to it's up to the referee to decide whether it's significant or not. Yes. Yeah. So, so, but my question is, what what if you make mistakes when you choose the mask? So, if if you have masked that source, would you have enhanced the flux density there? And then how biased? are the images depending on the mask you choose and if if we all create this image yeah what so they're the, definitely we, we get the same thing. yeah so they're definitely biased um as david said yesterday i mean there is some bias in, in this process but it's important but, but, that you have some a priori information of what you're doing when you do interferometry or uh no um you can also not draw a mask at all if you like so if you have very complex emission like everywhere and you don't know where, so there are some cases in which you just don't know where to start. Then you would just try to be as unbiased as possible and you just let clean, take peak, uh, take uh, choose the next peak and, and go from there. As long as that doesn't look like just noise. But sometimes it's very hard. Sometimes you're looking at a complex cloud where you just have like significant emission everywhere. You can't even tell if it's noise or if it's emission. You can compare as Mark was saying, you can compare the RMS of the image to the theoretical noise that you would have expected um, from, from your observation uh, to, 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 to see if that is just noise or if it's just complex emission. But so it's some, sometimes you just cannot, cannot do it. David. Uh, to say, sometimes you want to make a different image with a different weighting yes. scheme that has different point source uh, characteristics. And when you have something complicated, sometimes if you change the dirty beam shape you have a better sense of what's real yeah but but yeah sometimes it's intrinsically hard but yeah but you're not biasing your your flux up or anything i i, I think i mean maybe you are at some level but i, I don't think you are yeah. so I, I, I would just say all these things i mean imaging and decomposition especially tend to be semi iterative processes and i'll talk about this more uh later this afternoon but you always want to kind of check your images, check your results. Um, because if you do make a bad assumption, like let's say there happens to be a point source in your field of view and you only mask, or there's some mission coming from some other place in the field of view, um, and you only mask for the region, for a particular clean region, you'll see the artifacts coming in from that point source in the residual map. And it, oh, yeah. It yeah, will that's become true. clear that you've made a mistake. Um, but it is a little bit, it does take a little bit of getting used to looking at these maps and saying, is there anything that looks weird? Is there anything that looks non-random in my residual map? Um, yeah. And yeah, you're always working with incomplete information. Um, but there are, the a priori assumption of clean is that things can, to first order, be described as point sources, point sources of emission. Yeah. Um, which is not a crazy notion, right? Almost everything <laughs> to some degree is a point source, if you are blind enough. If you can make <laughs> enough point sources. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Any more? Yeah. An image that is emitted on data, um, do you prefer using CASA or Neuro to I've never, I've grown up with CASA uh, as a 
PhD students, so I've never used Myriad, to be honest. Uh, Myriad, I hear, is faster, um, but I don't know that how the algorithms <coughs> specifically differ. Uh, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, at least the hog bomb algorithm. It doesn't have the pointy clicky feel. Yeah, it doesn't have it doesn't have the pointy clicky feel. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't have this, and I think also the inversion and the convolution is two separate yes. tasks. I mean, typically, they are in concept, but it's all in one e big monster. Yeah, yeah. They they both underneath the hood, they both do very similar things. Um, so if you're only imaging a single field of view, they tend to have actually. Yeah, we've done some tests actually with SMA data with mirror imaging with mirror and, and, and CASA and it looks very similar with the simplest hog bomb deconvolution. I don't know if mirror has more complex multi-scale cleaning and things like that. It doesn't, but, but it allows you to do lots and lots of different interesting things that may or may not be kosher. So you, it will give you enough, what's the expression, enough rope to hang yourself with. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you, Myriad like is uh, has switches and bells and, and whistles that will let you do really crazy things that make no sense. Um, because one of the researchers working on Myriad decided it'd be really cool to have a switch that did X with her product. So yeah, so I mean, different people have different preferences. Um, the most complaint I hear about Casa, uh, at least in my building, is that it's it's it can be very slow uh, compared to compared to Myriad. Um, uh, yeah. 